I can't recall that I actually, I'm sure I read articles about writing, a writer's digest or something. It seems to me I've read things in that when I was young. But the best background for becoming a writer is to read stories that you admire. But my hope is, and my thesis is, that a worker's right book contains uh, not just the residue of some such uh, knowledge, but uh, it self-exemplifies that. For instance, there are dialogue sections that don't have any dialogue cues. And they, uh, of course, exemplify what I like to think of and has tried to teach to my students through the years, the Mende principle. Men and there are two words from classical Greek that mean, on the one hand, this, on the other hand, that. But I think the subtitle uh, of, the, of the book is, uh, in, uh, is in indicative of what, it, what I hope to convey with it, how language makes stories. Uh, the language is a wonderfully rich and supple tool. Uh, often in my writing I'm, uh, is criticized because of its use of long and difficult and unusual words. And because of the richness of the vocabulary, it's as if I shouldn't use them, no one should use them. They should simply fest uh, undisturbed in uh, lexicons. And of course, that's grotesque. The rarer a word is, uh, the more precise it's likely to be. And uh, really, precision is uh, unquestionably one of the great values in, in all good writing. The five par uh, archetypal themes that I utilize are the contest, the trickster, uh, metamorphosis, scapegoat, and taboo. If I did it again, I would add a sixth archetypal theme, the quest. A, a good mystery novel, and I admire a good mystery novel. The novels are rexed out. The Nero Wolf novels are rexed out, it seems to me, are splendid accomplishments. But a good mystery novel is a, a quest motif. It's, uh, and it's one reason that... It, it, that Scholars are interested in mystery novels usually, often because uh, it's research, basically. Who done it is to find out something from the past, to create the origin of something that's happened uh, more recently. And uh, this is an enormously powerful theme. The fact that I refer to these as archetypal themes is intentional. I cannot speak for all cultures in the world. Of course not. Nobody is that wise or that learned. But uh, so far as I can tell, these themes are virtually universal. I think every uh, culture has a trickster figure, whether it's David uh, and Goliath, or whether it's the trickster monkey in Western African folklore, or a trickster monkey in uh, Oriental folklore, or the snake trickster in, um, in Genesis in the Bible, or the trickster coyote uh, of the American Indians and the fox. Uh, Renard the Fox in Europe, of course. So these things, um, and there are always uh, contest stories, and that David and Goliath would be an example of that as well as the trickster. And metamorphosis, every story is about change, but uh, if a story is essentially about change, then it's a metamorphosis story. Uh, a story is a sequence of changes that exists in a small box of changes. But uh, some stories are simply about this. And you can tell the difference, of course. Scapegoat and taboo are taboo are, uh, stories are everywhere. It's a Polynesian word, which means has to do with uh, somebody not being eating from the same plate as the king ate from, or you would die, something like that. Do you write regularly? And my answer is no, I don't. I write from inspiration. And this is treacherous, treacherous advice. I wouldn't want to... I give it to other people because apparently there are a lot of people who simply write mechanically and they can be very great writers like Anthony Trollope who makes it clear in his autobiography that he had a very strict schedule that he abided by. And I know this, that sometimes a, a very non-literary impulse can eventuate in a story that you're very proud of. So you, we cannot easily distinguish that which is a good uh, I, story idea and that which isn't. I did quite a bit of reading when I was a college student, and but my reading didn't often coincide with assignments, so my, um, my grades were not inspiring. I remember Philosophy in a New Key by Susan K. Langer. 
And I thought that was a wonderful book at the time. And I also read her book on symbolic logic, which I found fascinating. I read novels. I, I, I uh, have always liked the novels of Joseph Conrad. I think my favorite is Victory, not, uh, and uh, which uh, all the characters are dead by the end, but the victory, of course, is the victory of the life force. But uh, my reading has always been wildly miscellaneous, and I regard this as a kind of wacky freedom. My name is Jack Matthews, and I'm going to read a short passage from my book, A Worker's Right Book. Um, this is a, a, a small chapter called The Pointedness of the Tale. Uh, I use the word pointedness with regard to short stories in a way that I've never seen anyone else use the word, so maybe I've actually invented something here. But anyway, I'll, I'll read what I have written uh, with regard to that. The Pointedness of the Tale. We write stories for the same reason we read them, to contemplate the mystery of how one thing leads to another. This is a wisdom that uh, connects with all our parts of our lives and helps us to learn how to live, an art we keep learning all our lives if we are lucky and worthy of the task. In saying so much, we have already crossed mysterious boundaries, because while everything in a good story is necessarily information, information alone won't do it. It takes more than that, and no matter how we define truth, truth will never in itself provide that depth of satisfaction that a good tale brings. The fact is, if we had to make a choice, We'd rather read a story that's lively than lifelike, any old day, although maybe it would be hard to tell the difference. Or if you could tell the difference, maybe the difference wouldn't make any difference. For example, if we read a narrative that is interestingly written but doesn't seem to go anywhere, we are frustrated and even for the moment a bit demoralized. This story doesn't have a point, we cry. And indeed, this is the point I am headed toward at this very moment. For nothing is quite so mysterious and interesting in the art of fiction than the signal aspect of form. A story, we say, must have a point, or it simply isn't a story. Here we are not talking about simple recipes for excellence, but about the essence of storytelling, its pointedness. But wait. How many of you noticed that I have just dealt from the bottom of the deck? I have inserted a new word into the argument, a new instrument into the orchestra. How many neighbor metaphors can you count in this paragraph as they uncoil under my groping hands? And how can a story have a point anyway? Do you say that various bits of information come together at the end, or somewhere near the end, much as the wood and the lead pencil comes together at its point? You are right, but the point here is that point and pointedness are not exactly the same. And while we can legitimately ask, what's the point of the story, and make perfect sense, the word, like all words, will not stand still for us. And the instant we pluck it from its context, it uh, betrays its inadequacy. Because when we ask for point, we are not necessarily asking for point, as I will soon make clear. The point is, if a story is too pointed, which is to say if it exists too entirely and obviously for the sake of the point, expressible as an epigram or moral perhaps, if it is too easily translatable into something of this sort, we are likely to be disappointed. We have lit uh, learned not to trust such tidy mechanisms and do not believe in those complete closures of plot that were once so admired. Note the semantic affinity between closure and point. Point for most readers has become as noxious a trifling with reality as the old-fashioned moral. And we know what stories that provide morals provide for most readers. They provide incredulity, contempt, and in the last analysis, boredom. They can be downright demoralizing.